Uh, I'm Nan Fang Yu. Uh, I'm a, now a associate professor of applied physics at the Department of Applied Physics and Applied Math in Columbia University. As a kid, I was very interested in insects living in South China, where the environment is uh, is very nice. I was out with my friends in the summertime all the time, looking um, at insects, small animals, or the drawing of them, uh, including plants, and uh, of course catching butterflies and other insects. Notes, childhood. Back then, summer was endless. We darted through its long and iridescent meadow like little fish. Each flower had its own sharp scent and emanated light. We chased for the dart and scurry of insect life, the grass like an infested pelt, hopping with crickets, the butterflies blue flit, the dragonflies electric tilt. Were we like insects then? Did the hot sun on our bare backs hatch shimmering wings? Did we fly? I'm conducting research with my students, primarily experimental research on uh, optics and specifically uh, optical devices and uh, biophotonics to study how light, not only visible light, but visible and invisible light, and how these different components of light interact with small animals, and in particular insects, because insects are fragile, they are tiny. Unlike us, you know, we are bulky, if we are under the sun, we will be heating up in half an hour, while as small insects, tiny ones, you know, if you put them under the sun, they will heat up to a steady state temperature within 10 15 seconds, so they are constantly in, in the struggle of getting overheat. Or if you put them into in the shade, then they, they can sometimes get uh, overcooled. So it will be a harder time for them to take off again. I want to say that these common environmental conditions for us humans or, or bulkier animals are actually quite thermodynamically challenging for small animals. So the purpose of the line of research on biophotonics is to, to understand how insects have uh, either physical adaptation or behavioral adaptation to allow them to uh, better live in the thermal dynamic environment so that they can better deal with sunlight, they can better manage their body temperature. Although they are cold-blooded, but temperature is very important, especially for flying insects. Um, it's actually very important for their body temperature to be sufficiently high so that the wind beating frequency can be sufficiently high such that they can lift themselves into the air. So there are two ways we conduct this so-called non-invasive uh, inspection of the butterfly wings. The purpose is, of course, to let the butterfly to stay alive uh, or stay as healthy as possible. One involving using thermal camera and the other using just ordinary camera in the visible range. So for the thermal camera one, it's actually quite uh, straightforward. In that case, because we are conducting an uh, experiment in the lab, we have to somehow simulate the environmental condition. And to do that, we uh, use a, a lamp which has uh, the light simulating the sunlight and also using a cold uh, substrate, which is cooled down to a lower temperature, a few degrees C, and try to mimic the cold sky. You know, the, the sky actually has a much lower temperature than the uh, terrestrial environmental temperature, which is, you know, room temperature, 25 degrees C or so. So these two components are important, the lamp and the cold substrate. Of course, we can tune the cold substrate to vary the temperature to simulate different environmental conditions. Like in South Africa or, or in Australia, th this type of environment, I expect that the, the sky temperature is very low. So we use this cold plate to simulate different degrees of humidity of a clear sky. So with these two components, we put our butterfly subjects in a container 
which is、uh, sufficiently large but not too large, so that they can still walk about but not not flying around too freely. And we just shine the thermal lamp onto the butterflies, and then we use thermal camera to record their movement. So there's a caveat here, because not all the materials are transparent in the wavelength range that thermal camera can see. Thermal camera only sees the thermal radiation spectrum range, which is in deep, deep in the infrared. It's a spectrum called the、uh, mid infrared spectrum range. So what we use as a cover of the container then is a very thin plastic membrane. So it's largely transparent. In that case, you cannot use a pane of glass or some thicker plastic because that will become opaque in the thermal radiation spectrum. And、uh, we just observe the behavior of the butterflies、um, from the start. So what we observed is that the butterfly will often start to bask themselves in order to warm up the thorax. As I have alluded to, they must have a sufficiently high body temperature. The thorax temperature, in order to、uh, let their wing to beat at a sufficiently high frequency, in order to take off. So the first thing, almost always, is that all species of butterfly collected from the field, they will start to bask themselves under the lamp.、Um, but we then see very interestingly that that、um, actually their wing heats up much faster than the thorax, and the reason for this is that the wing. Is a lot thinner than the body parts, so they are having a much much lower thermal capacity. Thermal capacity is basically how much light it can hold. So a thinner object will have a smaller thermal capacity, and therefore it will reach its、um, steady state temperature at a much faster rate. So it will take much less time to reach the steady state temperature. So、uh, in the case of the butterfly, the wings are much thinner. Than the thorax, than the head, than the abdomen, so the wings heat up much quicker than the thorax.、Uh, and the, what we observed is that if the lamp is sufficiently strong, simulating say a full sun, then often their wings gets overheated very quickly.、Uh, this happens、uh, before their thorax actually reach the. The threshold temperature in order for them to take、uh, flight. So, because they feel their wings are overheated, then they will just stop basking and、uh, now walking about, but still cannot take flight. So, this happens also not only in the lab but also in the field. We observed this behavior often if the day is warm, if the sun is strong, they bask for a very short time. And often the termination of the basking is because their wing gets overheated, not because their thorax are warm enough to take flight. And the wing, of course, quickly cools down, and then they open their wing again to continue warming up their thorax until their thorax are warm enough to take flight, and then they take flight. So that's、uh, using thermal camera for studying butterfly wing. Notes, experiment one. Pursued by a full beam, the butterfly turns face on, then turns face on again, shifts in its little dish, like the gnomon of a sundial, telling solar time, knifing the light with clean shut wings, so its shadow falls behind, blade thin. Presents as little of their membranes as it can, is meticulous. Precise, cannot let them burn. There's actually another experiment involving behavior of butterfly that we used a thermal camera. That is, instead of using a big, large area lamp to illuminate butterfly subjects, we now use a collimated, very tiny pencil of beam. Uh, only aiming at specific area、uh, over the wing themselves, not anywhere near the thorax or near the head or near the eye, near the abdomen. So in this way, we can we can be sure that we are triggering 
local heating of the wind themselves. Um, and uh, we conducted this type of experiment for um, I think about 50 species of butterflies collected from our neighborhood in New York and uh, New Jersey. And what we observed is interestingly that um, all the species of butterfly, once you heat locally their wing to a temperature of about 40 degrees C, then they will start to move in different ways for different species of butterfly. But this 40 degrees C is uh, we consider to be a triggering temperature or threshold temperature uh, at which the butterflies are starting to feel too uncomfortable. Uncom then they have to move because it's burning on one spot on their wing. So through this experiment, we basically prove that butterfly wings um, has the sense of heat. Um, and they, they can use actually their wing as a very uh, sensitive um, indicator of the temperature because wind is thin uh, they can respond to temperature change uh, very quickly so it's a very good way actually to monitor the the, the strength of the sun and we believe they use this uh, they use their wing not only for flight but now they can use their wing as a temperature panel to measure the strength of the sun uh, so that they can they can try to prevent the overheating of the wind Notes. Experiment 2. Dark room. A pencil beam of heat trained on a butterfly's wing. The many ways a butterfly will flinch, opening and shutting itself like a fan, or trying to flick off the aggravation like a woman brushing a housefly off her arm or pulling back fast, like a hand retracting from a searing pan. How it rotates, how it works to warm its thorax, conserve its wings. And the other technique uh, we are using is simply to observe butterflies um, under a visible, ordinary microscope, actually, not a camera. This one is a a little bit invasive, but we are trying to do our best. Let me describe that. So this one, we are trying to observe the the neural network distributed over the wing. So we have to do some staining process. And the, the, the material we are using is a type of blue uh, stain called methylene blue, which is um, known to stain neuron uh, tissues. So it has been used quite some time ago, but uh, somehow people never used them for staining butterfly wings. So to do this experiment, we have to first cool down or calm down the butterfly. And uh, depends on the size of the butterfly, some smaller ones, we can just put them on ice. Uh, once the temperature is, is cool, then they become very calm and uh, numb. And then we can inject a tiny amount of uh, this blue stay into their thorax and for larger ones and uh, those very active ones then we have to use uh, even a cooler temperature or using some type of uh, co2 gas you know we are using dry ice uh, which is the solid state of co2 uh, which has a lower temperature and also in the meantime provides a co2 gas so let them go into a state which is uh, which is calm but still alive uh, after a couple of hours and uh, then we inject the methylene blue. And then we just wait for a few hours to let their cir circulatory uh, system to carry the blue dye into all, all over their body, including the, the blood vessel, the circulatory systems in the, in the wings. And then the next step is that we carefully fasten the butterflies using a low melting temperature wax onto a glass substrate. And then we can use a very, very tiny uh, paint brush to gently remove the scales from both sides of the wing, uh, which will enable us to look into the interior of the wing. Um, we believe that this type of experiment hasn't done before. It's probably because this uh, we need a very a pair of very agile hands to 
to delicately remove the wing scales so that after the remove, mm, removal of the scales the wing becomes totally transparent then we can put the subject under an optical microscope and watch what happens to the stained parts of their wing and uh, in that case we can clearly trace out the entire neural network distributed over the wing uh, and these are distributed not surprisingly along the butterfly wing all the way from the base of the wing to the margin of the wing including there's a uh, along the margin the very margin of the wing there's a very thin uh, blood vessel and uh, by tracing such neural network we are able to also identify a network of uh, uh, mechanical sensors distributed over the butterfly. Notes Blue stain lullaby for the white M hair streak. This is your ultraviolet lullaby. This is your song of dry ice and calm singing you be still, be numb. In this white and sterile room, we will light you up from the inside out in blue. We promise you viburnum, sumac, sourwood and plum if we thought you would sustain this harm. Forgive this longing to know why. We are flightless, we are human. We love you, it is time. These mechanical sensors have two types. One is shaped like a disc, the second is shaped like hairs. So this is not new. Actually, um, some biologists have already studied uh, these two types of mechanical sensors in butterfly and moss wings using the technique called the electrophysiology. Basically, implant very tiny electrodes into these mechanical sensors and then they can record electronic signals from them upon mechanical triggering and uh, through this type of experiment previous researchers has discovered that such two types of uh, sensors are actually having different functions the disk type of sensor is responsible for sensing the deformation of the wing you know the stretching or bending of the wing and the hair type is responsible for sensing the vibration frequency of the wing the flapping frequency of the wing so although not studied for butterfly but people studied this in more detail for grasshoppers and they have proved that active feedback from such mechanical sensors distributed over the wing to the brain uh, of the animal enables them to take a better flying pattern. So we believe uh, strongly that that's also the case for butterfly, although no one has proved that, but um, I, at least myself, I believe um, such mechanical sensors are very important for butterfly to take very complex flying uh, patterns. There are many examples showing that butterfly can do very, very complex flying gestures. I watched the blue morpho during two of my trips to Ecuador in the middle of the uh, rainforest. But this is a very, very dense jungle, full of foliage and vines and tree trunks. And such large butterfly, they can very elegantly squeeze themselves through these narrow gaps in the rainforest, which is quite amazing and uh, we observed a group of butterflies from the family of uh, Raudini Day. They can actually fly upside down uh, before they are landing. So they will turn themselves upside down and then they will land actually underneath the leaves. Uh, you can imagine in order to do this, the two wing has to coordinate in a very non-trivial ways in order to, to turn themselves uh, around. And of course this is uh, for, for their safety so that they can uh, avoid the predators and uh, maybe also to avoid the, the, the downpour of the wind which is quite often in the rainforest by staying you know under under the leaf they can they can be dry and also away from predators 
and uh, I, I believe in that case, of course, the mechanical sensor distributed over their wing is responsible for letting them to sense the airflow so that they can, together with their eye, of course, they can take the correct gesture to navigating around. Uh, many years ago, I thought butterfly wings or insects' wings are just a piece of dead membrane that is solely for the purpose of uh, fly, not for sensing. But now, through this study, we actually found they, they are actually more complex systems. It's a very nice sensory mechanical integration, which I think could have uh, perhaps engineering um, implications. We also actually observed that the the circulation of the insect blood or hemolymph flow in the butterfly wing through just observing non-stained butterfly, but of course with the scales removed from both sides of their wing, um, looking at them under optical microscope. And from that, we can monitor basically the circulation of uh, hemolymph in and out of the butterfly wing and find quite a fascinating type of pattern um, slightly different for different species of butterfly. We studied this for a butterfly called uh, Pentilady, Vanessa cardioi, that's the species name. And uh, we observed in that case that um, the, the blood flow actually has a tidal pattern. It flashes in and out in a periodic fashion for this butterfly. It's very interesting that the the wing wing serve as the conduit actually for many things. It is the location for the blood vessels. It's also the location for the trachea, you know, the air pipe, and also for the for the root of the neural network. So these things are all located in the wing wing, uh, and we observe that because the blood vessel and air pipes are sharing the same wing wing, um, then once the blood are flushed into the wing wing, you will see very clearly an expansion of the blood vessel. And uh, during this moment, actually, the volume of the air pipe decreases in their size. So uh, that is to say, actually, the airs are drawn back into the thorax from the wing and vice versa. At some other moment, uh, the blood is drawn from the wing back to the body, while as air are pushed into the, the wing wings. So you will see an expansion of the air pipes and the shrinkage of the, of the blood vessel. And this periodically happen depends on the degree of activity of the butterfly. In a calm state, um, when the pendant lady is at room temperature, not trying to struggle, we see this repeating pattern is on the order of half a, half a minute, on and off, on and off, fairly regularly. But of course, if you if you stir them, they will quicken up this cycle of blood and air in their uh, in their wing. Wings. We thought them dead, external, but found them to be sensate able to interpret thermals, a network of trachea and splayed nerves that feeling breathes. We began to imagine a membrane subtle as a bat's ear, a kind of fine stretched tympanum, an outward receptive brain that flinches, swerves, how the soul, skinned, might feel its shimmering amnion attuned to the slightest touch, recoiling from force, bidden by a most merciful warmth to soar. So then we are using our microscope, different magnification, looking around um, this center organ. And we find actually at the corner where the blood is um, exiting the center pad, there is a pumping thing, which is relatively large, ac actually, and pumping very, very periodically, and uh, it looks rather like a like a heart. That's the the discovery of the wing heart. We we give it the name of wing heart, uh, which we think is a discovery. 
Um, so this organ is ro located right at the corner of the scent patch and uh, beating there like a pump and we believe the purpose of this wing heart is to um, vent the insect blood from the scent pad or to enforce a unidirectional flow of blood uh, through this um, scent, scent patch otherwise you know the scent patch is filled with cells which is uh, you can see them under the stained butterflies numerous cells within them for perhaps producing the insect pheromones and there are also numerous branches of the neural network there are also pillars here and there which goes from the bottom membrane to the upper membrane serving us like a pillar to separate the two membranes to create a, po a such pocket of unfused membranes so it's very complex so that we imagine without the help of the wing heart maybe the hydro dynamic resistance will be too large for for the butterfly to push the blood through the scent pad while as with the presence of the wing heart maybe it can better help the ventilation of insect blood from this organ so that this part of the wing can be supplied with insect blood uh, by a larger and readily supplied by insect blood notes blue stain revelations here is your wing in methylene blue. The tracheal tube breathes in and out like the ocean. Your pale lymph shows star white like quick spirits rushing, sudden sprints in the same direction. They wash across the cells of your scent pads. These have died in variants of green like translucent clustered beads of sea glass. Here, at your scent pad's crux, a heart-shaped pump. Um, the reason that uh, in the morning you get out of the bed and you're feeling cold, feeling cool, is due to a combination of convective cooling and radi radiative cooling. That is to say, your skin is temporarily a lot hotter than the surrounding walls and uh, furniture so that there is a net energy loss radiating from your body to the surrounding environment through uh, thermal radiation. Uh, so that's at least the, uh, half of the reason that you are feeling cool. Uh, now coming back to butterflies, we take this uh, spectroscopy measurement over the butterfly wing and we discovered that, uh, interestingly, the living parts of the butterfly wings, that is to say the wing wings and the scent pads, they have elevated thermal emissivity compared to non-living regions, namely the membranes between the wing wings. So this term thermal emissivity is a jargon. It's basically a quantification of um, how capable a material is able to lose heat by thermal radiation and it ranges from 0 to 1 1 is the best and we found that the thermal emissivity of wing wings and the scent pads are actually close to unity close to the best while as the thermal emissivity of the membranes between the wing wings is is much can be much lower uh, 0 0.3 0 0.2 0 0.5 nowhere close to to unity so as a result of this um, highly regional and uh, selective re um, enhancement of the thermal radiation over the butterfly wing, uh, we found that uh, the temperature of the uh, wing wings, the scent pads, can actually be much cooler than the rest non-living parts of the wing by as much as 10 to 15 degrees C under the, illum the uh, illumination of the full sun. So you, you see by c the combination of two, these two effects, one is overall the butterfly wing will be bright under the infrared portion of the solar radiation. They can bounce back a lot of the solar energy. So the overall the wing can stay a bit cooler. And then furthermore, from the perspective of energy dissipation, 
they have this non-uniform dis distribution of uh, thermal emissivity, selectively elevating the ability of those living parts of the wind to dissipate energy, then those living parts can stay even a few degrees cooler than the rest part of the wind. So the combination of this allows them to cool down the living parts of the wind. And then this, in combination with the behavior of the butterflies, will ultimately allow them to uh, live in a very complex environmental condition. Um, that's, I think, uh, is a, a very nice contribution and, and quite, uh, quite new to the science, this uh, physical adaptation that we discovered. Notes. Hyperspectral 1. Hot damn! On the thermodynamic spectrum, your scent pad is bright mojito green, your edges alcopop marine, in between your veins you glow bright chilli pepper red and burn. Notes, hyperspectral 2. In infrared you are fuchsia pink, scarlet, scorch violet, your thorax lit like a welder's fire, hot white like an effigy in flames, convulsively bright, electric veined, you radiate. So the butterfly wing is um, the result of many um, contributing factors through the history of evolution. It is trying to do many things and uh, the visible part of the wing has a lot of function. In, in the case of Morpho, maybe they are using that color to signal to each other. In some other butterflies, they are using them as a warning signal. In the case of monarch butterfly, you know those very strong contrast between orange and black are usually a warning color, advertising that butterfly itself is, is, is poisonous. So the, a lot of purpose is devoted uh, um, to the butterfly wing. And uh, these are primarily in the visible range. But butterfly wing has to also stay healthy, so they have to maintain a, a reasonable temperature. So butterfly, although they cannot do too much about their visible coloration, um, because visible coloration and visible pattern has to uh, do some other very important biological functions. But aside from this visible portion, they can do a lot of things solely for the purpose of thermal regulation. That is in the near infrared, that's the invisible portion of the sunlight, which contains about 50% 50, 50 of the solar energy. There, essentially all the animals cannot see that part of the color. So it's free to design what color, what, whatever color that is. So that's the reason universally all butterflies make their coloration, so to speak, in the near infrared, invisible portion, to be very, very bright. That's the reason under the thermal camera we are seeing the butterflies, no matter it's deeply black or lightly colored in the visible, in the near infrared portion of the solar spectrum, they are always very bright in order to try to minimize the solar heating. So they can solely devote the near infrared portion of the coloration for thermal management, whereas for the visible part it's more delicate. There are a lot of competing requirements so they cannot make their, their wing to be, to be very light in color. Notes, 